Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, before uh, I start, uh, uh, I would like to thank to Thermo Fisher Sciences and Lab Roots for enabling this virtual event. As you see uh, from my title, uh, I will, my talk will focus on the novel mechanisms of endocrine resistance in breast cancer. Just a brief introduction. Um, breast cancer used to be uh, considered as a single disease, uh, but with the progression of time, uh, it was classified as hormone receptor positive or uh, negative, mainly estrogen receptor positive. And then uh, in the late 80s or early 90s, uh, the HER2 positivity uh, became an important uh, marker, and especially with the availability of the HER2 positive uh, therapies, uh, it became a key player. And with the advent of the novel technologies, such as microarrays, uh, usually around 2000, uh, then uh, the uh, molecular classification uh, came into the uh, scene and mostly four different subtypes. Uh, two of them are estrogen receptor positive, luminal A and B, and HER2 positive or HER2 enriched or basal-like carcinoma. So these uh, new novel technologies, uh, mainly microarrays, also uh, led to the uh, novel RNA-based prognostic tools. And with that, uh, MomaPrint is one of the earliest ones and Oncotype DX. They are based in a microarray or QRT-PCR, but due to the time constraints, I will only focus the Oncotype DX, which is uh, the widely used in the clinical setting, at least in the US. So, uh, as you see from here, um, it is a recurrent score assay, meaning that predicts the uh, uh, likelihood of recurrent score and then based on the proliferation genes mostly, uh, specific to ER positive or to negative early breast cancer. You can see here some estrogen uh, related genes and invasion or HER2 also in there. The main thing is uh, this test, it classifies uh, ER positive breast cancer into three groups, uh, mainly low risk, uh, intermediate risk, and high risk. And if you look at the Kaplan-Meier plot, uh, you can see that the low risk patients really good, do good, so very good prognosis. The high risk is always aggressive and also uh, poor prognosis, therefore, and intermediate group, on the other hand, in between, and we don't know uh, which one will uh, recur and which one not. So this uh, led uh, the uh, designing of the Taylor RX uh, clinical trial, mainly to determine the uh, role of chemotherapy in intermediate score group, and then uh, whether it's useful or not, that is mostly uh, important. And if you look at the um, Kaplan-Meier plots, uh, there are two groups mainly, uh, the group that uh, chemotherapy and endocrine therapy together given, uh, this is a randomized trial, and endocrine therapy alone. If you look at those curves, either invasive disease pre-survival or overall pre-survival Kaplan-Meier plots, we don't see a difference at all. So meaning that um, the, uh, low risk patients and then the uh, intermediate risk patients, which makes about 70% of the patients, do not benefit from chemotherapy, but they may develop recurrences. So therefore, it is necessary to develop uh, novel targets beyond uh, proliferation and uh, prevent these uh, recurrences in these patient uh, group. So a uh, little bit back to the basics. Uh, as you know, there are uh, multi-layer molecular regulatory levels, uh, DNA level, RNA level, protein, and network. So we kind of uh, early studies focus on the DNA, mostly mutations, but with the advent of novel technologies like next-gen sequencing and microarrays, mainly advanced uh, microarrays, I would say like ClearMD, we can look at the into details of the RNA regulation, like alternative splicing events or uh, even non-coding uh, RNAs and so forth. And there are some studies, of course, at the protein level and different druggable pathways, but most of the state is mainly DNA and RNA, which I would like uh, briefly go over. 
So uh, one of the pillars of the breast cancer research is uh, the TCGA network uh, analysis, usually from the frozen uh, tumors, uh, not only for breast for everything, every cancer that is pan cancer, but here for the breast cancer, uh, you can see that at the mutation level, um, here are the uh, many, these are the major mutations that is classified based of the molecular subtypes on the left side that I mentioned before. And then they combine the clinical data uh, like tumor size, node positivity, negativity, and also copy number status. If you look all of these uh, parameters, actually uh, one take home message from this uh, study is most mutations are infrequent. You can see uh, mainly the PIK3A in the left hand side and TP53. These are the most frequent ones in all groups, 36% or 37% respectively. But if you look at the all other mutations, you can see the numbers 3%, 2%, 1%, meaning infrequent. That, of course, makes the randomized trials uh, to very difficult because usually they are uh, targeting the um, because of the power of analysis, larger uh, subgroups. And uh, therefore, uh, well, mutations are uh, not uh, only the only factor, probably, and given the infrequency, let's go to the RNA level. And then um, we decided to especially do transcriptome analysis and uh, try to find out novel mechanisms that can go beyond the um, proliferation-based genes. So we started, we started to look at the uh, Metabric data set. This is also another pillar uh, cohort analysis in breast cancer, uh, mainly uh, they did integrated analysis of copy number and gene expression of 2,000 breast tumors, which is a, 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 big, a, tri a big size. And then um, if you look at the left-hand side, uh, this study uh, classified the uh, breast uh, tumors into 10 different integrative uh, clusters. So you can see in different colors, all of these based on the bad prognosis, good prognosis, but since our focus is ER positive subtypes, I would uh, like to focus on the right hand side, which is the, um, the cluster three and seven. The cluster three is the red color, which is uh, considering the better prognosis, while the cluster seven is a uh, poor prognosis. So we looked at the expression data of those uh, clusters and then end up with three different uh, differential expression accumulated on those three different chromosomes, mainly chromosome one, chromosome eight and 16. So it wasn't very surprising that much because those chromosomes are heavily uh, suggested in uh, uh, cancer, including breast cancer regulation. But uh, we identified those two genes uh, being in chromosome eight ESRP1 uh, and chromosome uh, 16 ESRP2, these are associated uh, uh, genes. And then uh, they are upregulated in uh, those patient groups with poor patient groups, which cluster seven. So uh, it's just a brief um, introduction. What is epithelial splicing regulatory protein? Actually, they are uh, RNA binding proteins and they are splicing factors. So in the literature first uh, identified uh, as a functional importance for uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition, EMT, controls splicing of those genes and uh, regulates alternative splicing events, mostly cassette exons. However, uh, it was not uh, at that time uh, available the biological relevance in breast cancer and clinical outcomes, so we decided to pursue that. Here you can see on the left hand side the Kaplan Meyer plots. What we did actually, we used the data sets uh, for both uh, microarray uh, based. So the first four uh, plots is actually um, the first two at the uh, top uh, is the uh, Breastmark online tool, which comprises 26 um, data sets of breast cancers and derived from 12 different microarray platforms, including the Affymetrix early arrays of U133 and others. And then you can see that if you look at the ER positive versus ER negative, the uh, red, the high ESRP1 expression is highly correlated with poor prognosis in ER positive, but not in ER negative. 
If you look at the uh, the bottom two bloods, uh, which is the TCG and breast tumor that I mentioned, really go, we looked at again the ESRP1 um, expression in ER positive negative, and we verified that it is important in ER positive group rather than ER negative. So the another thing we looked actually, since we are focused on the uh, resistance to endocrine therapies, what does it mean in terms of tamoxifen treatment, which was available uh, data, and then chemotherapy. And you can see in the middle uh, panel, uh, it is highly associated, the high overexpression with uh, tamoxifen uh, therapy resistance, but if you look at that, it doesn't do any difference with the chemotherapy. So this kind of uh, further verified that it is important in actually resistant uh, mechanisms. And if you look at the, on the right-hand side, uh, we wanted to look some cohort with the Oncotype DX scores available. And uh, with this, you can see both ESRP1 and ESRP2. It is uh, highly expressed significantly in the high score, high risk group. Uh, intermediate, yes, a little bit trendy, but it is not significant compared to the lower group. And by the way, I am not showing the ESRP2 because it was not significant in all of the groups. So we focused the further analysis to ESRP1 only. And then uh, next, we decided to use some acquired resistant uh, models, preclinical models to endocrine therapy. These are MCF7-based therapies, LCC2, which is tamoxifen resistance, LCC9, fulvestran, and also cross resistance to tamoxifen. These are the uh, main uh, standard of care therapies for endocrine therapy in the clinical setting. And uh, we stably knocked down ESRP1 gene in those uh, cell models using the lentiviral transduction system. We later used CRISPR, so we verified it. And here um, uh, we have successfully shown that the um, ESRP1 knocked down in the uh, upper uh, left side, uh, both at the RNA level and uh, protein level, we knocked down it very uh, successfully. And then uh, you can see the different clones. We chose one of the clones to further continue with the in vitro and in vitro analyses. So in the right-hand side, um, top and bottom, you can see this cell density and cell viability assays that we have tried different assays. Uh, the main message is, if you look at that uh, with the knockdown, uh, you can see a decrease in the cell growth, uh, including tamoxifen, uh, estrogen treatment, and all. It's further decreement, but um, it decreases the cell growth. And uh, if you look at the in vivo data on the uh, lower uh, left side, uh, for, for the both models of resistance, you can see that uh, the um, ESRP1 knockdown um, it can uh, block the cell growth, reduce it significantly, or block the tumor growth also in vivo. So uh, next, we decided to look at the alternative splicing event. As I mentioned, the ESRP1 is a splicing so it makes sense. Uh, it will change to some of the alternative splicing events in these uh, uh, models. And here, just a brief background, uh, as you know, uh, in the constitutive splicing, the introns are removed to form the mature uh, messenger RNA. And usually these are very tightly regulated process. Exons always uh, either uh, removed or uh, included at the same uh, locations. Uh, however, aberrant, uh, transpiration, uh, aberrant splicing events happens, and then it may cause diseases like cancer and others. So briefly, uh, the events, uh, the exons can be excluded or included like uh, cassette exons. It can be more than one exon uh, excluded or included, or the splicing can occur in the five prime splice site or three prime. You can have a very a long or short uh, exon, and of course, introns can be retained. So according to the uh, literature, the ESRP1 mostly involved in the regulation of the cassette exons. Here is a schematics uh, showing that uh, one of the scenarios or implicated in the literature that uh, the ESRP1 regulation uh, of splicing can be ESRP1 motif dependent or independent. In the case of the motif dependent, you can see that the motif can be upstream of an exon, then the exon is skipped. Uh, if it's within the exon or downstream of the exon, uh, 
uh, the exon is ex included. So this is, of course, if the in, in ESR were motive involved, but there is independent motive once, but it's very complex, so I don't want to go into detail. Here, uh, then we decided to look at the um, alternative splicing events uh, using the human transcriptome array, HTA2, which is the previous version of the ClearMD. And you can see uh, the, the donut um, plots here uh, showing uh, different, uh, uh, different levels. The circle shows different uh, levels of um, uh, gene level or alternative splicing level uh, changes. And then the first two uh, includes the, all the genes and alternative splicing events. The middle two is significant ones. And the, the last two representative of the frequencies of the, uh, the alternative splicing events with ESRP1 motifs and also correlated genes. And the um, uh, level, uh, looking at the volcano plots here, we see similar upregulation and downregulation of the genes at the gene level. And then, of course, we wanted to look uh, first at the EMT genes because it has been well defined that ESRP1 is important for the EMT genes splicing. And then uh, here's a structural view from the tag transcriptome uh, uh, analysis console uh, of the HDA. And you can see that uh, each of the boxes actually representative of probe selection regions, PSRs, uh, the highlighted blue shows the changes within the given uh, uh, genes. And then you can see either um, uh, down or up uh, inclusion or exclusion for the given locations of the PSRs. If you look at the big picture, these are the 10 genes that has been uh, shown before important for the ESRP1 uh, function. And here, uh, the second column uh, shows the Varches and uh, Karsten's group, which they first defined the locations of the chromosome, chromosomes where the exon uh, events uh, happened, cassette exons. And then here, the third one is OR location, which is exactly the same locations we have observed, uh, most of them same exon skipping or inclusion. Uh, by two different uh, methods. Actually, we used previously uh, RNA sequencing for those uh, knockdown uh, models, and we use the HDA. So more or less uh, similar results, but uh, sometimes we haven't seen some uh, consistent results with the RNA sequencing, giving that uh, the depth uh, uh, coverage, uh, as you know, uh, may have some uh, bias on the RNA sequencing, whereas the uh, HDA is independent of that because of the probe based essay. So next, uh, we further look to what kind of uh, mechanisms are involved in the knockdown uh, besides proliferation genes that we are looking for. So uh, to our uh, interest, the metabolic uh, uh, pathways genes uh, were um, uh, reduced uh, in terms of ESRP1 uh, knockdown. Here you can see the protein analysis that uh, mostly FASN, SCD1, and PHGDG, these are the uh, important genes in metabolic pathways. You can see in the tamoxifen resistant uh, gene when it's knocked down to C3 column, uh, most of them gone or maybe a little bit uh, down with the FASN. With the fulvestran group 9C2 column, you can see also down with the knockdown uh, while the tamoxifen one is more uh, significant compared to that. Then we looked at the uh, seahorse metabolic assays because it's one of the ways to use it in, in vitro uh, readout. And uh, you can see on the right hand uh, side, if you look at the middle panel, uh, if you look, there are two different energy phenotypes, uh, either the glycolytic uh, capacity or the, um, the micro mitochondrial respiration uh, mechanism, which is indicated for oxidative, oxidative phosphorylation and looking at the sphere respiratory capacity. In terms of uh, glycolytic capacity, we didn't see uh, so much change uh, in both of the models. Uh, if you look at the sphere respiratory capacity at the bottom, we see uh, the knockdown increased mostly in the uh, tamoxifen uh, resistant model, but not in the uh, fulvestran resistant model. 
So, uh, of course, we also looked at the alternative splicing events uh, in terms of these uh, metabolic uh, pathway genes in ESRP1 uh, knockdown models. If you look at the top three, FASN, SCD, and PHGDH, uh, we have seen at the location, locations shown uh, the inclusion uh, of these exons in both of the uh, models consistently. There are some others that we confirmed that it has been shown in the in the ESRP1 uh, splicing, like CD44 and FGR1 and 2. So it's consistent that we are seeing those changes too. So one thing I would like to emphasize is, of course, the phenotype change because uh, for the EMT genes, we have seen the same uh, exact splicing uh, events, but we haven't seen any phenotype of the EMT. So therefore, uh, we are not focusing on EMT genes, but uh, we continue uh, with the um, uh, splicing uh, of those. So, okay, what does it mean in terms of the relevance of alternative splicing events and ESRP1 in ER positive breast cancer? So, as I mentioned, uh, current therapies include uh, endocrine uh, therapy, and we have identified ESRP1 is one of the markers of resistance, and uh, both tamoxifen and fulvestrin. So, how do we go forward with this uh, for the clinical setting? The CDK46 inhibitors, these are a new set of uh, drugs that is uh, becoming a standard care of therapy in the endocrine uh, resistance. So these are uh, very uh, important, especially uh, it showed a longer progression-free survival in uh, patients with endocrine ther therapy resistance patients like um, eight, uh, 10 months, but still overall survival is needs to be worked out. So of course, we wanted to know whether um, the ESRP1 knockdown uh, can be behaved like, like if we use these inhibitors, we can take care of the ESRP1, ESRP1 signaling uh, and reduce the, um, or prevent the endocrine uh, resistance. So, um, what we did actually uh, using the uh, Clarim D assay, uh, we wanted to look at the uh, both e gene level and transcriptome level. What kind of uh, differences uh, we are seeing? Especially, uh, you know, I've shown uh, the differences based on the transcriptome analysis of ESRP1 knockdown, uh, and then we want to see if we uh, use the same. Um, uh, endocrine resistant cells and treat with abemeciclib. Abemeciclib is usually uh, originally developed by uh, Lilly and uh, in clinical use FDA approved, but uh, we use the uh, abemeciclib from Selec. And uh, so we decided to do the clearing D assay. And here you can see by the uh, Venn diagram uh, what are the common uh, genes and what are the unique genes to each of the uh, treatment or NACTA. So we have uh, found 77 uh, overlapping genes uh, that are uh, both changed based on the knockdown or abomasic treatment. And if you look at these uh, pathways, uh, and it is usually cell cycle and mitosis and DNA repair, which is expected. So um, abomasic lip is a CDK46 inhibitor. And if you look at further unique genes, on the other hand, uh, you can see further cell cycle checkpoints, DNA replication. So it's a huge in-depth. Uh, these pathways are coming with the abemesic treatment. If you look at the ESRP1 knockdown, on the other hand, we see a unique uh, uh, group, metabolism and cholesterol biosynthesis, so which is not taking care of the abemesic lip. So what does this mean? Mainly, uh, if you look at the ESRP1, uh, both proliferation and metabolism genes are regulated. And if you knock down, you can take care of both mechanisms, so dual inhibition of these mechanisms. If you only treat with abemeciclib alone, on the other hand, we only take care of the proliferation-based genes, and uh, it doesn't do anything to the metabolic pathways. If you add tamoxifen to it, so you don't see any difference, so it doesn't do anything. 
So that uh, kind of suggests that we also need to uh, block the metabolism derived uh, pathways in addition to the proliferation pathways. With that in mind, uh, we did a couple of uh, comprehensive assays. Mainly, uh, this is the uh, integrated analysis of transcriptomics and proteomics. Uh, if you look at the individually, uh, we previously I shown that we did the um, HDA assay with the gene level alternative splicing level uh, in response to the markdown, which A and B. When we did, we did this rib chip assays, mainly RNA immunoprecipitation chip. In this uh, sense, we combined RNA immunoprecipitation with the clearing due declaring D microarray, and then looked at the uh, same gene levels and the splicing levels. And we also used the um, uh, in the precipitation proteomic assays. So we combined all of these assays together and to find out what are the main genes that are interacting with ESRP1, because ESRP1 is also an RNA binding protein. So we wanted to see what kind of RNAs are binding to ESRP1 that we can further continue with these um, genes in terms of metabolic genes I'm talking. And next, here you can see the detailed uh, view of the uh, RNA uh, immunoprecipitation uh, clearing the assay. Uh, here you can see the uh, that is specific to the uh, knockdown rather than the IgGs. And if you look at the Venn diagram, the 143 genes that are specific uh, to uh, endocrine resistance cell line coming up, in order to narrow down 143 genes, uh, we did this integrative analysis and then uh, come up with ESRP1 and PHDGH the most uh, important genes to further uh, focus. On the uh, right-hand side, the uh, upper corner, we also did the RNA immunoprecipitation and RTQ-PCR to verify the results from the RNA clearing the assay, so which is uh, ver verified. And uh, we also look at the uh, messenger journey stability uh, in response to ESRP1 knockdown. You can see on the left side, uh, ESRP1 uh, stability is uh, half-life uh, is reduced uh, with the ESRP1 markdown is expected, but it also affects the PHGDH uh, uh, as messenger and stability. You can see from three hours to in uh, almost uh, less than one hour, and all as you see with the gap TH, we don't see any difference, which is used as a control. Of course, we also did the uh, PHDGH knockdown uh, for the cell lines. Uh, and here on the upper side, you see the uh, clonogenic assays for the um, tamoxifen resistant cell lines. Uh, this time, we also use a, a non acquired uh, resistant cell line, which is T470 in that case, which has uh, aggressive, but it's not an acquired resistant model. So we can see some uh, proliferation reduction, cell growth reduction in uh, clonogenic assays, uh, but these are 2D assays. So we are planning to write right in the process of doing the in vivo assays to see the real impact on the tumor growth. And um, we also looked at the seahorse assays for the metabolic uh, readouts. And you can see on the upper, um, the endocrine resistant uh, cell line versus PHG knockdown. In terms of the glycolysis, um, we don't we see some uh, uh, decrease, but uh, with the uh, uh, base spare respiratory capacity, which is more oxidative phosphorylation uh, uh, representative, we see a huge increase uh, with the knockdown, which is uh, confirming the results like the ESRP1 uh, knockdown model. On the other hand, with the T470 model, we don't see those. So we would like to see whether there's an acquired resistance versus uh, non-acquired resistant um, uh, difference. So uh, we are continuing uh, to further understand uh, uh, the role in those uh, models. So with that, 
uh, I would like to conclude and uh, my take home message is we used uh, uh, transcriptome analysis in different uh, uh, settings. So as I uh, mentioned, first we used in the uh, clinical setting using uh, genomic data sets, uh, microarrays or all RNA uh, sequencing available uh, sets uh, for from uh, tumors, breast cancer, breast tumors. We use those to identify or uh, target uh, with clinical outcome. It's very important to find out to be went from the bad, bad side because you need to see something that is important, challenging in the clinical setting. And then we took it to our uh, preclinical models and used uh, the transcriptomic analysis to understand uh, the differences at the gene level and alternative splicing level. And then uh, we used uh, Besides discovery approach, we use it as a targeted approach and to see whether the impact of in ESRP1, the knockdown using the uh, uh, knockdown antiviral vectors versus to the drugs, because you can't use these uh, vectors in the clinical setting. So whether the, the current drugs are able to uh, overcome uh, those uh, uh, effects and uh, used those and compared and came up with a uh, new um, uh, target pathway, which is metabolism, because uh, right now, mostly proliferation is taking care of the uh, standard of care therapies, but metabolism is still a, a question how to do it. So we use those uh, techniques to target uh, metabolic pathways, and then uh, we are suggesting that targeting metabolic pathways in addition to the proliferation uh, might provide a novel uh, way for controlling the endocrine resistance uh, in uh, breast cancer, and we are uh, we would like to in the future try uh, other drugs uh, to target metabolism together with the proliferation. With that, I conclude, and I would like uh, to thank my uh, lab members and my uh, collaborators at IU and outside IU, and also Tama Fisher Group, especially for their help in both HDA and Clarendia. Thank you so much.